Okay, go ahead. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. And well, I guess good evening to those of you who are in North America or South America. Um, if you're joining this uh, lecture series for the first time, welcome. And um, we are delighted to have you with us. Um, so uh, this lecture series is called in International Primatology Lectures on Past, Present, and Future Perspectives of the Field. Um, which are organized by the Center for International Collaboration and Advanced Studies in Primatology, uh, also known as SICASP, at the Primate Research Institute of Kyoto University. And uh, what we hope to accomplish through these lectures is um, um, to listen to uh, distinguished primatologists from across the globe tell us about their um, careers um, and how their perspectives on the field of primatology have developed over those years. And uh, actually this year we've already had five guest lectures so far and they are all archived on YouTube. So I'd like to invite everyone to uh, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, check them out. Um, so now, uh, the director of SciCast, Dr. Mike Huffman, is going to introduce today's guest speaker, uh, Professor Karen Stryer. Okay, thanks, Susumu. Um, welcome, everybody, those of you on Zoom and those of you that are joining us on um, the live stream. Um, 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 it's, it's great to have you all here again. This is the sixth of our series, and we've got a, a lot of interesting things ahead of us. So please stay tuned for all of the future lectures. It's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Karen. Um, she's been a friend for a long time, a good colleague and a very, very good friend. And um, many of you I'm sure have, have followed some of the work that she's done, but um, we'll, we'll hear a lot about everything she's done, I'm sure today. She's a professor at um, the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She did her master's and her PhD at Harvard, and her advisor was Irvin DeVore, one of the um, founding fathers, as it were, of field primatology in the United States. And he's, he's, his name appears in, in a lot of, of, of primate um, literature that I, I'm sure you, you may have been familiar with. Um, as for Karen, I'm not sure if my camera is on, but um, as for Karen, she's a very prolific writer and a lot of books that she's written um, are, have been on the, on the shelf and have been um, up, updated quite, quite often. And one that I'd like to advertise now is her book, Primate um, Behavioral ecology it's it's basically the the, the, the Bible of, of, of primate behavioral ecology it's a book that I go to often especially when I write um, entrance examinations for graduate students at Kyoto <laughs> University it's, it's an excellent um, source of, of information that you can rely on I, I feel like a car salesman but this is the real deal it's it's, it's a great book um, and two other books that I would really encourage you to read, one, the first book of Karen's that I got is Faces in the Forest. Mm. This is a 1992 version, but it's come out a couple of times with, with nice um, covers after that. And then one that I was very honored to participate in, Primate Ethnographies. This is a really good chance to learn about how a lot of different um, primatologists got into the field and how they experience field work and everything. Um, and just one more thing about, about Karen, I'm sure she'll, she'll talk a lot about it in her talk as well. But one thing that I've always admired about Karen is, is her warmth and how she takes care of her students. She's got a, a large number of, of students that she's mentored over the years. And she puts a lot of effort and time into that, not just in North America where she's based, but also um, the students in Brazil. And I really, it, it admire you for that, Karen. You've, you've really built a, a tradition and, and help establish primatology in, in a very significant way um, with our colleagues in Brazil. So before I start 
crying and tears start <laughs> welling up anymore. And before you get too embarrassed, I'll hand it over to you. And I really look forward to your talk today. Great. Thank you so much, um, Susumu and Mike and everybody who's here. And it's a great opportunity. Um, I was going to start with a picture of Mike um, sitting in my chair in my study, the same room I'm sitting in now at home with one of my cats in his lap. But I didn't want to um, embarrass my cat. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, but also um, the book that Mike held up, my Primate Behavioral Ecology book, I now know what to get you for Christmas, Mike, because that is the fifth edition. And this just a few months ago, the sixth edition just came out. Ah, so um, thank you. You're still in it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to, um, in this opportunity, I want to start, I, my title was From Theory to Practice, and I was basically going to try to tell my story. And um, so the first part of this is not so much science as the, maybe the history of a scientist. And um, my work with primates actually began with studying baboons and at Amboseli National Park, and then um, escalated or elevated to studying uh, Murray Keys, the Northern Murray Keys in Southeastern Brazil's Atlantic forests. And um, the way that this sort of began was um, with an interest really in understanding behavior in an evolutionary sense. But one of the um, most interesting things to me about, about what's happened in my trajectory is that um, I've really changed a lot of my questions and a lot of my focus. And so I would say that conservation is at least as prominent, if not more important to me than, um, than the evolutionary theory. But that has informed a lot of my thinking about how we integrate behavior and cons conservation over ecological time. And if any of you are coming to the International Primatological Society meetings in Quito in January. I'm going to talk more about these themes in uh, my presidential plenary there. But what I want to do today is um, to kind of look back, and I know that that was part of the purpose of this series, what led me to the Murray Keys, what primatology was like in the early 1980s um, from a very much American perspective. And um, so it will be interesting maybe in the discussion if we have an opportunity, especially with people from other parts of the world to hear how some of those perspectives may be different for you. And then I'm gonna um, talk about some of the insights that I've gained from Murakis and how much I think that these can contribute to conservation and management for more keys as well as maybe other primates. So a lot of people start out with their stories of themselves as children loving primates and this is not me. In fact, if you notice, I've blocked out the face of the, um, of the child here who was a fan of mine and um, <laughs> solicited from me all kinds of uh, information and gifts and did a whole poster session, which is actually quite lovely, especially um, some of these things that she did. This is me. I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. There were some um, maybe prescient themes, like looking back and thinking back about um, my childhood. I, I really like to prepare for things. And so even as a kid, I carried food with me anywhere I went. And I always carried something to read. And probably this combination of being a good primate interested in um, subsistence and liking to read contributed to a lot of my trajectory. What I really wanted to be when I was a kid was I liked the idea of Wonder Woman. And I really think I sort of looked like her, um, not in every feature, but at least maybe the basic hair coloring and eye coloring. But that was not to be my path. Um, I instead ended up on a path that began really with animal behavior and rodents. I was an undergraduate freshman, my first year of college at Swarthmore College, interested in animal behavior. And I had this wonderful professor, Ellen Schneider, who was a physiological psychologist. And he hired me to work as a research assistant in his 
lab, which was studying memory and amnesia. And um, I think that the research itself was really fascinating. It was to try to understand the mechanisms of what, what, what happens to memories when they're lost. Do they disappear so that you have to relearn them? Or do they, um, do they stay somewhere? Is the amnesia just a process, a problem with access, with, with retrieval of the memory? Um, I don't think during my time in the lab, we, we did definitely did not solve this problem, but I learned so much about science and I continued to work with him even after my sophomore year when I got introduced to anthropology and especially looking at sort of humans in the natural world and their interactions with one another. And it was this combination of these sort of working with animals and trying to understand what makes, what, how, you, how you can understand behavior. And then also thinking about it in a bigger context of humans and nature and outside that led me in my junior year to use um, a very unusual piece of equipment that many of the students in this audience have probably never seen. Um, it's called a typewriter. Uh, it's not, I don't, I think this one, I can't even remember now if this one was actually electric, but you may notice the um, whiteout in the corner. That's the way you corrected errors because there were no delete keys. So my junior year of college, I was desperate to get to the field and I typed about 40 letters because I had to hand type them. There was no way to, you know, just run a letter and change the ad mailing address and email didn't exist. And out of those letters, um, some opportunities came up. So one was to continue to work in the memory lab with rats. Another was to go spend a summer studying bears in North America. Another was to study red grouse also in North America. And the fourth one was to go to Amboseli National Park in Kenya to study baboons. So faced with these options, I chose baboons. And um, a very naive um, junior in college who'd never been outside the US, got on a plane and went to Africa um, to be a field assistant to a PhD student of Glenn Hausfatter's, the late Glenn Hausfatter, who at the time was a professor at Cornell University. And he had been a student of Stuart Altman. And this was, um, I spent six months in Amboseli as a field assistant. This was back in 1979 when there was still um, a big glacier on top of Mount Kilimanjaro there. And I really um, thought that I had died and gone to heaven. I couldn't imagine um, doing anything else except being outside and studying animals. I mean, it was just sort of where all of the things that I like to do and who I am came into alignment. And I said that I was really naive at the time, and I mean really naive, because when I went there, I had no idea who Jean Altman was. I, I met her there, and in fact, I am indebted to Jean because she didn't just kick me out. Um, it was, it was uh, Glenn Hausfeder who had hired me and Jean Altman who had to meet me there. Jean was just finishing her data collection for what became her famous book, uh, Baboon Mothers and Infants, and her very much delayed PhD. But um, I did read, and in fact, I actually stole from the field, um, field library one of the last um, copies there of her an, an influential paper, Observational Study of Behavior Sampling Methods. And this is the Altman 1974 paper that almost everyone cites about systematic sampling methods. And for me, it was, it was um, reading that paper while I was in the field studying baboons, having already gotten some of the rigorous experimental thinking as from my experience working in the memory lab with rats, it, again, it was like, wow, you can be outside with animals in nature and ask interesting scientific questions and get systematic data. I thought that was an amazing opportunity. So after Ambacelli, I went back to college. I had to finish my senior year and I had a plan. And the plan was, I really wanted to get a dog. And my undergraduate advisor 
had happened to have a dog that had puppies. So I, I got one of the dogs that was Babar. I wanted to get a car. And even though I loved, I liked baboons, I still thought bears would be really cool to study. And I, I still sort of thought I would stay in North America and study bears. I thought they were more social than people usually thought of them. And I liked the idea of being in the, out in the West. Well, I could not afford the car. And the bear study that I had been invited to work on after college fell through. The, actually, it was in Canada and the, there was some problem with the research grants and the permits for the researcher who was going to hire me. So I had to follow plan B, which was to go to graduate school. And as Mike said in his introduction, that led me to graduate school um, as a student of Irvin DeVore at Harvard University. And I know a lot of people think it's funny that plan B was Harvard, but um, I, really, I really didn't know much about what a life, what, what you had to do to have a life that let you um, spend a lot of time outside studying animals and um, being a scientist. So this was a great opportunity and I never really thought about when I applied to grad school, I didn't really think about whether or not I was going to study baboons. I just knew that um, my research experience with baboons would was something that Irv made me interesting to Irv. But of course, Irv was a, an anthropologist and he actually he had been a cultural anthropologist, a social anthropologist, his PhD advisor was Sherry Washburn. And this was a very anthropological view of primates, you know, that the social behavior of baboons and early man, it was all about using primates as models, studying primates as models for understanding early human behavior. And so if you think about animals and humans at different ends of a continuum of animals, of course, humans are also animals, you know, where you think of primates, if you think of them more like animals, then they're in the biological sciences. And if you think about them more like models for humans, then studying them in nature and is more in the social sciences, which in North America is anthropology. And that was the direction I ended up going as a result of my decision to go to work with Earth. Now, of course, I don't need to tell people in Japan about Japanese macaques, except to um, in the form of recognition of pioneering research on primates and how influential it was, not just in Japan, but actually into so many of our understand, understanding and theoretical perspectives about comparative primate behavior. And of course, in the US, um, Clarence Ray Carpenter and his, um, as coming from a psychology perspective and his pioneering study with the howler monkeys in Panama, um, as well as his long-term relationships with um, and, and appreciation and interchange and collaborations with um, Japanese primatologists, including the great Imanishi. But even within anthropology, back in those days, um, biological anthropologists or primatologists, <laughs> who's more trained as biologists, but live in anthropology departments studying primates, the, the boundaries between them and the cultural anthropologists were much more viscous in, in early days. And so um, anthropologists like Margaret Mead, you know, she considered Carpenter's study of howling monkeys and of gibbons to be really important reading. She says um, in a book review of Carpenter's study of gibbons, that this is um, this, this research, these, these monographs written by a primatologist should be part of every course and seminar of field methods in cultural anthropology because of the way of studying animals, non-human primates that don't presume an understanding of their language or their culture. So there were cultural anthropologists interested in primatologists. And then of course, Sherry Washburn, who was considered in the US in physical anthropology to be the father of our um, physical anthropology, primatology. And again, very much a perspective that primates were good models for humans 
and that we needed to look at them, other primates, in order to better understand ourselves. And so that Sherry Washburn is one of the reasons why Irv went to study baboons in Nairobi National Park and their perspectives about baboons, which were very much based on the idea that early humans evolved in savanna-like habitats, which are the ones that are occupied by baboons. And so if we understood something about the social behavior of baboons today, we could understand something about the kinds of selective pressures that impacted us humans in the past and in our evolutionary past. And of course, that was in 1958 when Irv went to study baboons. In 1960, Jane Goodall went to study chimpanzees. And so at that point in time, there were really kind of two kinds of primates that people were mostly interested in studying. People trained in North America, at least, like myself. Um, one was sort of the primates that were most closely related to humans. And the other would be the primates that might have the most comparative insight from an ecological perspective, the greatest ecolog ecological similarities. And it was this, you know, very much this divergence that um, shaped a lot of the ways that the study subjects that people were studying. I started graduate school in uh, 1980. And pretty soon after that, um, I read a, another super influential paper, this one by Allison Richard, called Changing Assumptions in Primate Ecology. And this is around the time that um, people were really starting to look more closely at a lot of the um, biological and evolutionary theories that had been applied in other animals. Sociobiology was published by E.O. Wilson in 1976. And people were incorporating a lot of these models of evolution of behavior, ext extending them across species and to come up with comparative models of behavior that could apply independent of the taxa. Allison's paper um, I thought was really influential because it was really shifting our perspective not to think about, I mean, <laughs> she basically says, if you wanna understand people, you have to study people. And that kind of left aside the fact that if you wanted to study primates, um, you can learn a lot about primates and a lot about behavioral ecology, but they weren't, um, <laughs> they, there were other reasons to study primates besides the value that they might have for understanding humans. And in this climate of thinking about the sort of the biological um, perspectives on primates at Harvard, I was um, inundated or you know, surrounded. There was sociobiology, which was a few years old. Sarah Hurdy's um, head was just publishing a few years later, the Langers of Albu, where she introduced um, and elaborated on the ideas of infanticide as an evolutionary strategy. And again, this is all this work was feeding into a lot of coming out of the bird literature and out of ungulate literature and bat literature and everything was putting it together in the classic paper by Enlin and Oring about ecology, sexual, sexual selection and the evolution of mating systems, which really develop the, the template for the theoretical perspective of studying the evolution of behavior, that ecological variables shape female behavior, female behavior shapes male behavior, male behavior affects the social organization and mating systems, and there are feedback loops between these levels. And by this time then, so when I went to grad school thinking I was studying primates because of their comparative perspectives, within you know a few years, it was really clear that um, the theories that we would be taking to study primates, the reason for studying primates might have still been anthropological, but the theories and theoretical perspectives were coming right out of biology. And so that pushed um, the comparisons in a different direction. And for primates at this time, um, and this is a classic paper published by Southwick and Smith that basically looked at the first 50 years of primate studies and showed an incredible bias in terms of the very small number of species that had been studied. So with one exception, howler monkeys done at the bottom there in the dark blue, all of the other primates that had been studied for to any great 
I should say published based on publications to any great degree were old world primates, macaques, baboons, chimpanzees, langurs, some, some gorillas and lemurs in there as well. Really strong bias in favor of old world monkeys. And to me, the, this sort of model of the theoretical perspective of predicting social behavior based on ecological variables combined with um, Richard Wrangham's very specific predictions about how you could generate this, um, use, use the distribution of food to generate these predictions about primate social behavior made me start thinking about what would be a really good model primate to look at these questions in. And my PhD advisor, Irv DeVore, who had studied baboons himself, had previously, 10 years before I got there, had previously been the PhD advisor to Russ Mittermeier. Russ Mittermeier, you all know, is the, well, was for many years the pre, um, in World Wildlife Fund, Conservation International, and now he's the um, one of the directors of Rewild, which is one of the most influential conservation species um, oriented conservation NGOs in the world. Well, Russ at the time worked for World Wildlife Fund and he was narrating a film about, um, to, he was doing excursions through Brazil and narrating a film called The Cry of the Moriqui. And he needed, he, he had helped produce this film. He needed a narrator and he asked Irv to narrate the film and Irv come in and he said, Karen, you should take a look at these monkeys. They really look interesting. And at the time, almost nothing was known about the Murakis except that they were these large, very endangered primates that were endemic to the Brazilian Atlantic forest. But I was interested in them because they were perfect tests for Wrangham's model. You know, for those of you who um, don't, are not familiar with it in a very simplified version of it is basically sets the distinction between, um, between primates that live in female bonded groups are ones that have to be able to that consume a lot of fruit, prefer fruit, but are able to shift their diet to more abundant foods. And the Murakis, no one knew what their diet was, but we knew from anatomical studies that they had a suspensory mode of locomotion which is associated with rapid travel between long distance travels. So would be consistent with a diet that was associated with fruit, but they also had teeth and um, large, large, long intestines, large, long, large intestines that were consistent with a diet of leaves. So anatomically, they should be female bonded. And yet we knew something about their closest relatives, spider monkeys and woolly monkeys at the time. And neither of those seemed to be female bonded. So the Murakis potentially offered this great sort of independent test of a model that was developed largely on old world primates. And that was consistent with all these ecological and evolutionary theories. So that's how I got and started with Brazil. I got in touch with Russ. I asked if I could come to Brazil with him. He said, yes. And so I, I followed him around. Um, he, I just basically traveled with him and a couple of other people. And it was the same year that the Golden Lion Tamarin Reintroduction Project was just getting set up. So Deborah Kleinman, who was involved with that, was also um, on that trip. And so we went to um, Russ introduced me to some people in Brazil. And, and from that, I got to um, get started at my field site. The Atlantic Forest of Southeastern Brazil is a completely independent um, ecosystem from the Amazon. So the Amazon in the upper picture there is in the yellow. And the Atlantic Forest used to cover the range from just this along the eastern Atlantic coast of Brazil there's only about six or 10% of the forest remaining and most of it is really fragmented. And today um, we know that there are only about 15 populations of Northern Murakis, about 30 populations of Southern Murakis. Altogether, um, when I first went to study Murakis, they were considered one species. And um, I've been to many of these places, but 
the place that I settled on was the first place I went, which today is a protected, um, private protected natural heritage reserve. But at the time it was just a forest fragment that the owner had protected. And despite his surrounding agricultural activities. And here you can see, this is a recent um, photo and you can really see the, um, how fragmented this is. It's about a thousand hectares and it's not connected to other forests. So in 1982, when I first went with Russ, we stopped in Rio and I met all the iconic um, Brazilian primatologists and Brazil is um, like many other countries in the world had a rich history of primatology and conservation that I was very fortunate to be able to join. There's Russ down there with Senior Feliciano, the owner of this forest. Um, if any of you have ever been in the field with Russ, you know he always um, wears shorts and he still does today as far as I know. Our first stop there was with the Golden Lion Tamarins. That one is pulling at my, my pants. And then we drove from Rio de Janeiro north to Minas Gerais. And this is what the countryside looks like. This is what was left of this region of the Atlantic forest. Um, on the way into the field site about, about 60 kilometers away in 1982, I took this photo of a whole hillside being deforested. It's now a beautiful coffee plantation, but there's no more forest on this hillside. And as we got closer to, um, to the reserve, what at the time was the fazenda, you know, again, coffee plantations, pasture surrounding it, but it was still a protected forest reserve. So there's Senor Feliciano um, standing in his coffee plantation with part of the forest behind him, telling us, me, Russ, and some of the other um, Americans that were, following, were, were traveling with Russ as well during this um, short period about how he had saved the, the forest because he had made an agreement with the prior owner of this land and because it was good because it provided humidity for his forest. He set aside a little house at the edge of the forest for research purposes. Um, at, we didn't have electricity or, um, or any kind of um, power until 19, I think 1991 it was, but it was really nice of him because me and some other researchers could live at the edge of the forest and you know walk to work literally, perfect. And there on the right, you can see what, you know, standing in the forest, looking out at what the countryside looked like, completely barren pasture, um, what was left of the Atlantic forest. And even while I was there during my 14 month dissertation research. So I went in 1982 for two months. Russ kind of dropped me off and left me there with um, another American student who was taking, taking pictures and then, and doing some getting, collecting data for an undergraduate thesis. And then I went back to Brazil alone for 14 months and for my dissertation research. And there was still some active, um, wood extraction, selective logging going on and, and coffee plantations within the forest. But it was really that, um, that early 1980, you know, what was known, what was known about Moriquis and the Northern Moriqui included at the time was pretty much um, a, a Brazilian perspective of what the distribution of the Moriquis were throughout Brazil and some anatomical studies in 1978, um, at Kisako Nishimura spent a few weeks in Brazil. I mean, people knew about Moranquis, but no one had spent any real long time there um, in this region studying them. So my dissertation work in 1982 was my first trip, 83 to 84 was my dissertation work, uh, was just basic behavioral ecology. And it's sort of the first decade of research when I decided to keep the project going and went back every year and, and began working with Brazilian students. You know, we could answer different questions as time went on. And the first thing from, was to stay with them and figure out what their diet was. And, you know, it, this was just such an exciting time because absolutely everything was new. You know, what do Marikis eat? Simple questions, no one knew. 
And I was um, in the process of documenting that. So about 50% of their diet, a little more than 50% of their diet was leaves and then fruit, flowers, bark. Clearly, you know, over the course of their lives, they were eating a lot of leaves. And they have, this is a very seasonal habitat. Um, there's a really distinct dry season and, and cold winter season, dry season, and then rainy season in the rest of the year when it's hotter. And, you know, so not surprisingly, food availability is also very seasonal. And when you look at these annual diets, in terms of the percentage of leaves versus fruit and other things, they were, they fit the criteria for being full of or frugivores. But I was also remember there was very little behavior known about monkeys. So I had to read everything that was available and that included papers on things like dental occlusion. And there was this really influential paper by Alfie Rosenberger and Warren Kinsey, which was basically um, about the critical function of teeth. And it's a really different perspective on evolutionary adaptations. And so when you think about diet and everyone was classifying diets based on what the highest proportion of type food in the diet was, they made the question that maybe at least at a morphological level, you should think not about what the animal is doing most of the time, but about what an animal has to do, what kind of um, anatomical features it needs to be able to survive during the critical times when there's no other options available. So it's not, it, it shifts the perspective instead of looking at what, you, what they're spending most of their time doing to what they're doing when they don't have any other options. Today, we might talk about it in terms of fallback foods, but these guys were looking at it from the perspective of what is evolution working on? It's working on what you do, what you need when you can't survive any other way. And that was really influential to my thinking because it switched this perspective on its head. So maybe what I was seeing was that, yes, when you add up the Marinke's diet, they eat a lot of leaves, but whenever they could, they were going for fruit. And that helped me be open to the idea that, so, you know, there was something wrong in my mind with the way we were categorizing primate diets based on how much of one kind of food they ate versus another. It helped me be open to the fact that so many features of their behavior didn't fit the female bonded model or the not female bonded models of the time. So, the other part, of course, was following the Marquis as they um, traveled around and understanding their habitat use and their social behavior. And I got to say that, you know, those moments under the during their long siestas when the Marquis were resting and I could just sit with them and really get to see them, um, get to know them as individuals. And you can see even in this picture that their faces have very distinct facial pigmentation so it's possible to recognize them by their natural markings and it was getting to know them as individuals and naming them and discovering something about their societies which again wasn't really known so you know what did we what some of the work that came out of this early this first year of just you know amazing phd luck was that where kids live in these incredibly peaceful egalitarian societies um, that this is true among males that stay in their natal groups for life, as well as between males and females, which is what was perhaps the most unusual, that male and female monkeys are similar in body size to one another and also in canine size. And so that gives, you know, females have, don't have a disadvantage. Males can't harass or bully females the way that they can in really sexually dimorphic species. And Males, instead of, you know, focusing on females, they focus on one another. They spend most of their time in proximity with one another, and they spend a lot of their time um, embracing basically strength, strong social affiliations. And this extends into their high tolerance toward one another when they're mating. And we don't see interference in one another's sexual activity. Um, I love this photo was taken by um, one of my former students who of a copulation, the male is sitting behind the female with his arm around her. And you can see there's an animal right next to her. That's another male. And there's, if you look behind his uh, right shoulder in the photo in the upper right corner, you can see another male. 
is just waiting his turn. And this kind of peaceful, uh, relaxed interaction earned the monkeys the reputation as being like the hippie monkey. So they live in these egalitarian, peaceful societies. Um, females are very promiscuous. They mate with multiple males. The males um, can hang around and try to get, get their turn, but they don't harass each other and they don't exclude one another. So a really different um, perspective on primates, so much different than baboons and macaques, which were what was sort of the typical um, idea of what a primate, a non-ape primate would look like. Um, also discovered early on that females disperse from their natal groups, and it did take a while to figure out that this happens when they're about six years of age. Reproduction is very seasonal, not surprisingly, given how seasonal their um, food sources are. But this means that during the birth season, it's just like heaven because there's all these little babies around. And that the birth season, um, and the birth intervals are about three years of age. And this means that, um, you know, kids get stacked. So a mother with her tear with her two um, successive sons, and those sons are going to stay in their natal groups for life with their mom and provide this opportunity for really extended kinship relationships, but not like baboons and macaques that are female bonded, um, more so like chimpanzees and bonobos. And so more like an ape model than a monkey model. What, one of the things that um, has been both really rewarding and one of the distinctive features of my project is that I decided early on that I wanted to work with Brazilian students and sort of get involved in capacity building. And Brazil has um, lots of amazing universities and people interested in students available um, and interested in working. And so over the years, um, I've trained and supported a lot of students. And they, of course, are the ones who are in the field right now, collecting the data and making it possible to keep these projects going. And I'm really proud of these students. A lot of them are running their own projects now. Um, many of them are working, have, have earned graduate degrees and are continuing to work in conservation and science. And one of the things they have to do, every one who comes to work on the project is learn how to recognize the animals as individuals. And we go through a two month training period, which involves drawing the faces and unique characteristics. We don't mark the animals at all. You can see here um, how different their faces are and how you know it is possible to tell them apart. And um, nowadays, of course, we can use photos and the early days we could only draw because photos were so expensive. But this is meant, you know, having these individual life histories over time that we can, you know, go from an individual at from birth through their entire life. And um, we have actually documented that in a project that's now going into its um, 39th year. So Murakis need take a lot of time to study. They take a lot of time to study because everything about their life histories is really slow. So females leave their natal group at six. Um, the first age at first reproduction is about nine years of age. And um, we knew nothing about their reproductive biology. So a big part of my study in the 90s and early 2000s was it, learning about their reproductive biology in a non-invasive way, and this involved collecting um, monkey poop from the from them. Uh, I love I love poop because it is these scat samples. Um, monkeys produce a lot, so it's usually easy to collect. It takes a little bit of training to learn how to collect from a particular individual, but it's just like magic because it's a renewable, recyclable resource. You can learn a lot from it and you're not touching the animals. And we could basically map down the entire reproductive cycles of females um, working with Tony Ziegler at the Wisconsin Primate Center with the samples and my students in our field lab extracting the steroids so that we could measure them when we came back. And the methods changing very much over the years, but um, we learned that gestation length is 7.2 months and that ovarian cycling is about 20, 21 days apart. So moms are really um, great mothers. They spend a lot of time taking care of their babies. 
babies take three years to grow up. So they're spending a lot of time with their moms. Mothers socialize with one another. They adjust their locomotor behavior to accommodate their kids, help their kids travel. This was just like, you know, total discovery of development period. And the basic reproductive biology of the animals began to um, really take off. By the end of the 1990s um, and around the primate taxonomy of the millennia, northern Murakis, like many other primates, were re-examined, or the northern the Murakis, and they were split by taxonomists into a northern and southern species. So suddenly the Murakis that I had been studying had a new species name. It's very confusing in the literature, but sometimes it's the very same animals. And I would also say that this also marked a transition in terms of the research. So, so here's just showing the northern and southern Murakis. They have some distinct physical characteristics, but I think what really cemented this, this reclassification of them into two species was a recent paper led by Paolo Chavez and Tony Di Fiore, where um, clear separation between the species estimated to be about 2 million years ago, which is about what it expected. Um, the chimpanzee bonobo split is. It's kind of hard to imagine that people thought these guys were the same species if they're that genetically different. But so after about 2005, new species studied in that um, completely different species. And this marked a change in um, just because of time, not because they had a different taxonomic name, but because now the study had been going on for almost 30 years. And suddenly we could start to look at different kinds of questions and I'm, I put this female over here and it says, you know, the president in the group in 1983 and she was seven years old because the species names change, but we're still studying the same individuals during this taxonomic um, split. So we um, were able to do genetic work also with non-invasive fecal samples. Uh, work, and this was also with Tony DeFiori and we have some new work coming out pretty soon, I hope. But basically looking at um, the fact that compared to other primates, um, murky males have much lower reproductive skew. And this is partly because that's even compared to other primates like chimpanzees and bonobos that live in male phylopetric societies because unlike those, murkies are the only ones that have egalitarian relationships and have proportionately lower reproductive skew. So we were able to confirm genetically what we knew behaviorally. But in this most recent phase, we've seen this big shift from, initially I was studying just the, there were two groups in the population and I was studying the group on the bottom there, the one that's in red. And it was early on that I um, knew that had detected new females coming into my group. And a few years later, some of the natal females in my group moving so there was female exchange between these groups. But over time, studying that main, that main group, the, the, the group and the population were increasing. And um, this just shows, you know, the first, um, not, even, not even the whole study period, just until June 2016, that the, pop, the study group increased from 22 to 130 something individuals, um, you know, just protected animals, positive demographics. And this also was a big um, sort of startling revelation to me because I realized that murkeys, um, you know, the changes in the group size for murkeys would really change. You know, when, when people talk about what's an average group size, it doesn't mean anything if your group sizes are in any way fluctuating. And so at any different point in time, you would get a different average group size for this same group depending on when you measured it. And it makes you wonder when you read about group sizes, which of these are biological mean, biologically meaningful. A few years ago with Phyllis Lee and uh, Tony Ives, we, we looked at this comparatively. And in fact, we found not surprisingly that demographic variation occurs in almost all long-term studies. And it pretty much contrary to what you might think, the longer you study population, the more stable it will become. In fact, the longer you study populations, the primates, the more variable they are, the more demographic variation there is. So I don't think the case for murakis is unique. And we know this to be true because people have looked at it, the consequence of demographic variation 
for other behavioral traits like the frequency or the prevalence of infanticide. It's a really important point about how we think about primates comparatively. But it also had a lot of impact in terms of looking at the more key behavior. And there were two big behavioral changes. I'm gonna talk about this really quickly because I've talked about these things before. One of them was when this group had doubled in size, they went from spending all their time together to splitting up, fissioning into fission fusion social systems, dynamics um, makes perfect sense because this was a way they could avoid competing with one another when food feeding sites were limited. And you can obviously see if a group gets too big, they can't all spend time together. And then the second big shift was a move into the vertical niche. And this was, um, again, when the group had increased by this time, um, the study group had increased and by now the whole population had increased and the animals, there was no place to go. There's an isolated forest. They started spending more and more time on the ground. And it's still only a small percentage of their time on the ground, but it's proportionately a lot of time. This expansion into the vertical niche we think had to do with habitat saturation. They had nowhere to go. It's been fascinating to document, um, you know, the animals walking around bipedally in one of my favorite publications of all time, but is one of the least cited by anyone except, except me. Um, we actually took in the first two years when this behavior was really picking up, we were able to document, you know, who was spending time, when did animals spend time down on the ground, who was spending time with who. It was really um, documenting the spread of this behavior in this group. And if I can get this to work, this was taken with a camera trap and it's actually available um, on, in, as, as a supplement to a paper of ours. But this is what anim, this is what murkies do on the ground when no one's there. They're, they're hugging, standing upright, hugging, coming over and having another hug. Um, you can see they're coming down out of the trees. They are in a, an open area and some of it's for food. But over time, we've seen that they come down to the ground for other reasons. And in fact, they spend a fair amount of their time on the ground, just hanging out, socializing, um, completely non-threatened. Non Some of this move to the ground is probably why the population um, seemed to be associated with a big increase in fertility, an unexpected increase in fertility. And it may have been that all this new food on the ground allowed the population to grow. And so at this time, we had that swift switch to fission fusion there on the back. And now I've put them on a different scale. So the lower line is the study group you saw before. And beginning in around um, 2002, we expanded. So instead of just looking at one group closely, we started looking at the entire population. And the other, the other groups in the population, one of them in particular was also using the ground. And you can see that you know this would have been really um, a really common, it's really easy to do. There are lots of the groups are um, color coded there on the right. The green group fissioned on two occasions. The red group has recently fissioned. It's not shown in this map, but they're using almost the entire forest. And having more groups created more opportunities for females to migrate between them. And we think that this was also really advantageous because it helped keep inbreeding down as the females are moving around to mate. And we can see that there was clear um, population saturation. You know, the monkeys were just going right up to the edges of the forest, um, you know, crossing pasture to get into other fragments outside the forest. And this obviously sets the stage for what we really need to do for conservation purposes in terms of connecting habitats. And that's an ongoing project um, being led by the people, the owners of the reserve and other colleagues of mine. The population was you know, really big. And then in 2014, we saw this um, two years of successive drought, the droughts all over Brazil, fires. This impacted the Murakis, their water sources dried up. And then right after the drought ended, the rains came back. And with the rains, we had yellow fever. And uh, we lost a lot of howler monkeys and um, the marmosets. And in fact, the other two of the three other species in the forest, the howler monkeys went down by 80 or 90%. The marmosets population declined by about 90%. 
and the Capuchins, um, 30 to 50%. Population losses between a 2015 and a 2018 census were conducted by one of my former students and now collaborator, Carla Passamai. With the Murakis, we saw in six months um, a decline. We lost almost 10% of the entire population. And this was really startling for two reasons. First of all, you know, the population had been um, up over 300 individuals by this time, having grown from 50. But a 10% loss in six months was, um, was really startling. We're not 100% sure it was yellow fever because we never found any animals to do the um, immunological studies. But we did find um, the coincidence of this population decline was huge. We found very few skulls, very few crania. This tells you something about in other places how that you don't know what the starting population is, how many more animals are dying than you really know. And I think it was this loss, just how quickly you can lose animals, all of our conservation gains. Um, well, we only lost 10%, but I would say that from about 2015 on, it's really changed a lot of the way I think about the future of this project. And even though we will continue to do the monitoring and continuing to collect behavioral data and, and expand our studies so much and now about what we can learn and use this population, this long-term study for has to do with conservation and management. And I just wrote an editorial, I was really grateful for the invitation to do this for primates um, called The Limits of Resilience. And I talk a little bit about this because this is the total population over time. So you can see that just until 2016, the population was just growing. It was so exciting to see um, this recovery, conservation efforts, protected habitat, um, you know, no, no hunting or poaching and, and all the tree, even selective logging had stopped and favorable demographic conditions. And then that first big decline was the yellow fever decline. But instead of the population picking back up, we've watched it decline, continue to decline. And although the rate of decline is slowing down, it still makes me very anxious. So today the population is still five times larger than it was um, all 40 years ago. But in five years, we've lost more than a hundred animals and you know, net loss of a hundred animals. And, and we don't know why. This just picks up that decline. And I, I think it's worth looking at. And it's, again, it's an example of what you can do with long-term data because those first couple of years there are just the drought years. And you can see the population does decline during the drought, but then it recovers again after the birth season. And it's not until that yellow fever, that steep decline there, where there's just that straight line there in the middle that you can see that that was the yellow fever. And then the population goes down then you see a recovery during the birth season, but then it drops again. And then we see sort of successive recoveries, but still net losses. So we're in a point now where I don't know whether the population is gonna pick up again or whether it is going to um, continue to decline. But in any case, it certainly is concerning me about what are the limits of resilience. And this brings me to the very last few things I wanted to talk about, which I think are worth mentioning, because one of the other things that we've learned from this long-term study is in all of these demographic changes, what kinds of um, behavioral traits are really flexible. And so their grouping patterns, the shift from cohesive to fission fusion to fluid groups, the switch to a ter ter terrestrial, um, increasing of terrestrial niche, those things change with demographic and ecological conditions. But the things that have stayed really stable, and we know this from this long-term study, as well as from now, what are now new comparative, recent relatively new comparative studies in other populations, is that their peaceful egalitarian lifestyle and the female dispersal patterns have changed. And the egalitarian lifestyle, I think, is really interesting because we've seen it in a subsequent study that um, Paulo Chavez did for his PhD dissertation that we're still in the process of writing up. But um, in a second cohort of infants, 
we see slightly higher um, male male paternity success, you know, the monopolizing their slightly higher skew, but um, and slightly younger age at first parenting. But it's still compared to other primates, a much lower percentage of skew, much lower reproductive skew. So very consistent. And the female dispersal. And this is so interesting in terms of the social organization and interesting as a mechanism of inbreeding avoidance. But it's also been really important because we've been able to use everything we've learned about female dispersal, the timing, the seasonality, the age, the behavioral indicators of it for um, ongoing management projects. And these include trying to re re recover, repopulate some of this really small populations of murkeys in um, a unique Murky house, which is sort of a combination of indoor, outdoor, encaged, and enclosed, um, soft release type type housing that some of my colleagues have been leading, and it's just been great. They've already had a birth in captivity in this setting, and one of the things that's so exciting to me about this is that we've been able to use the knowledge of dispersal patterns to find the females not from our population, but from other populations where the females have nowhere to go and no other groups to join and bring them into a place where they can actually help their species. So if I would say that when I started out being really exclusively interested in evolutionary theory and ecological theory, and then conservation in an exclusively in situ way, i have now watching how quickly and scarily we can lose, lose habitat or lose animals. Also think that strategic management is a very important part of any conservation plans. And I am still very optimistic about the future for murkeys for lots of reasons. Um, I love this forest and it's very well protected. Um, in addition to having all the documents and making it a protected um, reserve, the owners are engaged in a reforestation project, which includes planting and collecting seeds and helping to make it connected to neighboring forests. And this is an ongoing process. And the forest has grown over time as a result of some of these activities, as well as a result of natural regeneration, which we've been able to document just from letting, pass it, letting um, pastures recover. So I'm really still very optimistic. I think amazing new discoveries can still be made. I think small populations can show great resilience and that behavioral flexibility provides a buffer, but I don't think it's enough. And ultimately, I think that I'm inspired by this combination of in-situ conservation efforts that can be supported by some strategic management programs, which I really think can ultimately save species. And, you know, I'm also inspired by the fact that I've had the privilege, um, Mike mentioned it in his introduction of, you know, working with so many Brazilian students and so many of them have gone on to do amazing things. Um, they've, they're very dedicated. This is just from some of the meetings that we've been at. You know, these are students from my projects, some of them. And um, I've also had amazingly long-term um, collaborators who are, you know, good friends and, and really amazing conservationists and dedicated and, and just amazing people. And so I feel like the Murakis um, and the project has been in good hands with or without me at this stage. And finally, the Brazilian government um, and colleagues who work in the Institute for the Chico Mendes Biodiversity that helped produce a national action plan it's published 20, 10 years ago. And just recently, um, the, some of the products of this is a whole book of protocols for the research and management of Murakis some amazing um, guidelines that we were actually able to use in a recent rescue effort um, that's on, still ongoing. And we talk about this in a recent paper to really try to, um, to point out that 
Brazil and the Atlantic Forest and the Murky Project is such an integrated effort because it includes science and policy and conservation at every level and involves a lot of different people. And so um, even though this is one of my favorite pictures of myself, I was standing alone in a lookout tower um, looking for murder keys, but there weren't any, I didn't find any that day. Um, I actually put it here because it reminds me that I'm never really alone. Um, I work with a lot of amazing people and there are a lot of dedicated people working on the same project. And it's only by collaboration that we're ever going to be able to solve the problems of conservation. And we, I really think we can do that. Lots of people, lots of funding agencies have um, contributed to the project over the years. And um, I want to thank you for your attention and um, welcome any questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Karen. That was amazing. Really nice, nice story. You've you've done a lot of work and had a very good life. I appreciate her. <laughs> I have had a good life. I hope it's not over yet. That sounds that sounds uh, awful. <laughs> no, no, no. Of course it's it's not over. <laughs> I hope not. Not over just, yet. Just seeing so much of it oh, in, yeah. in just a few minutes. It's 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 mm -hmm. it's an amazing story. I'm I'm glad you could share it with us. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Well, thanks. Yes, thank you. Uh, it was such an eye-opening story, um, especially about the importance of long-term studies. Um, and so uh, let's spend the next maybe 15 minutes or so um, um, for a Q&A. And, &A. and uh, I'd like to invite questions from the audience. So we have a bunch of people on Zoom and also on YouTube, I believe. Um, so if you are listening on YouTube, please uh, go ahead and start um, typing your questions or comments on the chat board. In the meantime, I'd like to start with uh, people on Zoom. So if you have any questions uh, or comments, please um, raise your hand and uh, feel free to turn on your camera and microphone. Um, I think I saw him, uh, oh, uh, Dr. Uh, Zimbo, <laughs> let's go ahead. All right, do you mind I start off with the first question? Please. All right, uh, Karen, th thank you so much. That was very wonderful. It was very motivating indeed. And indeed, we, I, I'm sure I speak for many of us that we do not feel, we do not feel alone after seeing <laughs> your presentation. All right. Um, my question is that uh, given the state of uh, the primates, right, the conservation status of primates globally now, what is your opinion regarding uh, the way that research on primates is being conducted, are being conducted, and uh, the way it should proceed until a time when we can overcome the crisis that we are facing, both climate crisis and biodiversity crisis? I mean, the reason for this question, just to give you a background, is that a lot of uh, educational institutions are focusing on traditional science as in terms of testing hypothesis, which is mm -hmm. great, but uh, a lot of those tests may not have immediate applications. I mean, they, they, have, they have value in itself in terms of research, but we are facing a crisis. I hope I'm mm -hmm. making myself clear here. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen. Well, that's that's a great question, and especially coming from you, which, by the way, um, I just got my copy of Asian Primates, and in fact, I should show it up. I don't know. Can I, if I show something in the screen, will people see it here? Yeah, yeah. I will um, show it. Can you see that, everybody? Zimbo wrote the um, forward, was it? You wrote something, you wrote in the forward. It's just beautiful. So... It weighs about 12 pounds. I don't know. It's really <laughs> heavy, but it's gorgeous. But I have to say, you know, when skimming through it, 
so many species are critically endangered. And so it's not surprising that, you know, especially thinking about the ones in your region of the world, you would ask that question. But of course, that's also true in all regions of the world. So I think you're absolutely right, but I think there's room for both kinds of um, both kinds of pursuits. You know, scientific research, the hypothesis testing. I honestly don't know if we would have learned as much as we know about monkeys, and so much of that, what we've learned about monkeys, is useful for conservation. Is directly telling us how to manage these animals and how to how to um, how to think about the best habitats or the best kinds of um, dynamics that social dynamics and ecological scenarios and demographic conditions and reproductive conditions to that they can survive in. But I think that one of the um, one of the things that has come out of this big group of the Murky, um Action Plan project that was led by the Brazilian government group has been to think about the fact that not, not every single population needs to be studied with the same intensity. And so maybe um, we can do rapid surveys and find out where other primates are and what habitats need to be protected and what's the status of um, priority areas. And then have a few long-term studies going that are giving value to where you already have a backdrop of information that can contribute to um, some of the individual life histories and long-term um, details. So I think that a combination, and maybe if I were starting out, I would try to think about how to do conservation that was um, science-driven. Then I think that that, I don't, I think, you know, the part of conservation that involves working with people and ed conservation education and all of those things, you know, some of the things that give us, me and the people I work with, credibility when we talk, when we do those outreach activities is because we know so much about the animals and that we can speak with special specialty, um, speak with authority about them. But I agree with you. I mean, I think finding out what's out there finding ways to prioritize um, maybe where, which ones and the priorities may be because they're the biggest populations and it may be because they're the populations that have the best chance of surviving in climate change models. So, um, and finding ways to maybe save the populations that aren't going to do so well without connecting them to other places. We have all the tools we need. We know what we need to do. You know, save, prohibit, prevent hunting, save habitat, expand habitat, and um, and in some cases, strategic managing management where you maybe move some animals around. But I do think that the the leisure of just years and years of luxurious data collection to, um, you know, to write beautiful scientific papers may not be the best way, the fastest way to save these animals. And in fact, some of that effort could be put towards um, more surveying and, and um, more documenting efforts, more pra practical efforts. I guess I don't want to say that surveys aren't practical, because I mean, aren't scientific, because if you do them systematically, they are. But I think conservation without, without science, a science background is, is vulnerable to making a lot of mistakes. So the more informed you can be about your science, the better. Thank you. Awesome. Um I think Dr. Lydia Light has a question. Would you oh, like hi, to? Lydia. Uh, hi. hi. Um, great talk. Wonderful talk. I enjoyed it Thank a lot. You. Um, Thanks. I have a question about the male egalitarian situation. You identified that this is like one of these very stable traits. Mm -hmm. Can you envision any factors that might change that? Is this something that, that there might be risks thinking of the population decline or when it was saturated? Is there some sort of limit there? Or do you think that this is one of these traits that's just not, not in danger of changing? 
Well, in this population, uh, we have not seen it change. We see, and, and just to be clear, we see the egalitarian relationships within the groups, but you know, males between groups um, do engage in agonistic inner, nothing like chimpanzees. We've never seen um, such patrols and, and a lethal aggression in the Northern Muriqui. But we have seen, um, you know, we do see intergroup encounters. So I think it's it's important to to keep that in mind. I would have predicted if this was going to change in this population, we would have seen it already because there was a period of time where the sex ratio had become um, more male biased and there would have been more competition among males. We didn't see an indication of this, um, this greater, any kind of, change in consistent hierarchical relationships at all. Also the case that Northern Murkies have been studied now at some other populations and we don't see them. I mean, nobody's reported hierarchies from any of these populations under very different demographic conditions. I suppose that um, you could get a situation where, um, I mean, I would never from, even from management purposes, I don't think males from different from different groups should be should, that could lead to a lot of aggression and it would look like competition. I, I don't know if I would ever I would avoid mixing males, mixing up males from different populations or different study groups and not study groups, different social groups, different different kin groups. But I I suppose you could get some aggressive males and then come in and change it all around. But I don't, I have, I'm surprised that we haven't seen it already given all the changes we've undergone. So I do think it's pretty stable. Also keep in mind that the lack of dimorphism between males and females in body size and canine size, and also the fact that male monkeys have very large testes relative to their body size. And, you know, that, idea of them probably competing at the level of sperm instead of at the level of monopolizing mates may be um, indicative of, of, you know, more conservative anatomical traits that are consistent with the behavioral egalitarian relationships that we see. Mm -hmm. Sure. Definitely. Thank you. Sure. Um, question from Andrew. Yeah. Thanks, um, Sue. And, and thanks, Karen. That's that was really great as, as usual from my experience. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you remember it, but maybe the last time I, I spoke to you about Murikis was mm -hmm. back in the 2016 International yeah. Primatology Society mm -hmm. meetings. Mm -hmm. And you had just given a talk uh, that, was, that was largely centered around this kind of unprecedented increase in group sizes that mm -hmm. you've been observing for the decades. And then now, I mean, turning around, I see what a difference five years can make, mm -hmm. you know, pandemic mm -hmm. aside, but, but kind of related to the previous uh, point from Zimbo here in, from a conservation or management perspective, like how the point that you wanted to make was that what scientifically it becomes hard to say what an average group size might be if a population is so mm -hmm. dynamic and increasing over time. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side of that, I kind of wonder how alarmed we should be. So given the fact that you can observe such clear um, variation in dynamism over time, like how much fluctuation should we be prepared? You know, how risk averse should we be in conservation and management? I mean, you imagine like if anyone's an investor in the stock market, this, <laughs> that's a great, that's a great, uh -huh, uh -huh, <laughs> that's a great comparison. Um, and a really good question. And probably the thing, one of the questions that keeps me up at night and wakes me up in the middle of the morning, um, I worry about this so much, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm just watching more kids, you know, falling out of my population and wondering um, when it's time to, to start um, raising the flags. And in fact, to some degree, publishing those data in primates just in those in that editorial was my way of doing that just you know <laughs> letting people know this is what's going on in a in a more formalized way but you know I think it's it, in another sense Andrew it's right out of a textbook case that you know if if we had seen this proportionate in changes in population size when the population had 50 animals 
we would be looking at a population going extinct. What we saw was the population grew to 350 some animals and then it's been declining. Now, if it continues to decline, I think we will want to be prepared and willing to consider some kind of intervention, which might be, um, you know, might be bringing, trying to, to bring another, bring some animals into the population or maybe <laughs> moving some animals out so that we can um, protect the, the, the gene pool of this population. The habitat, um, I don't think it's habitat de degradation. I, I worry sometimes if there's some residual disease, but we just recently had opportunities to, you know, we know that there's, we know that we don't have any reason to believe that there's anything at least that we know of like yellow fever circulating in the population because we've seen no indication of it right recently. But because the population, even with all these declines, is still relatively large by, by, by endangered species, by critically endangered species standards, I'm wary but not, not red flagged yet. So I do, I do think these fluctuations matter a lot, but the two things like textbook conservation biology theory is the two things that make a difference are how big the population is to start with and how isolated it is. And this is a very isolated population. So one of the things that my colleagues and I have invested a lot of energy in in recent years has been trying to develop corridors and raise funds to implement the corridors. And in fact, there is a, a, a state recognized, like it's a legal document that recognizes a corridor between this population and another population of Murakis. And that just basically needs to be closed up. So we are all watching with great, um, great interest and attention what's happening right now in the climate change meetings in Glasgow, because one of the issues that's come up is for Brazil, maybe um, a mandate about reforesting restor habitat restoration. And if that comes true and there's funds to follow it, then I think we could be in really good shape in this region of the world, partly because we know that um, colonizing species in the Atlantic forest grow really fast. And some of those pictures I showed where you could see pasture in the background, those are old pictures that today are regenerated. And I did show a regenerating picture that you could see. And, you know, so in 10 or, 10 or 12 years, you could really make a difference in terms of corridors and habitat restoration and habitat expansion. Thanks very much. I guess in another sense, we could always think of these fluctuations as kind of the antidote to complacency as well. <laughs> always have to be on guard. <laughs> oh, well, I never got complacent um, about- No, no, about I, I wasn't <laughs> suggesting that you, yeah. <laughs> although although um, when I think about getting complacent about work is it's more a question of whether I whether this population is secure so I can shift some of my attention to another one. And it's almost like the Murakis heard that and decided, no, you know, we like getting all this attention, so <laughs> give, it, give it to us. But um, I would add to your question, Andrew, another another real concern that I, I think, and this actually also addresses Zimbo's point as well, or the, I should, I was thinking about this more, is that with climate change um, pro predictions, especially for some of these really fragmented regions and the populations of primates that are, are really vulnerable in their fragments. You know, we need to know whether these fragments are on the map for being suitable habitat in 10 or 15 years. So, mm -hmm. you know, you put all this effort into saving areas, but if the habitats are going to get too hot or too dry um, or too wet, or too cold, um, you know, that those become no longer very viable populations and the habitats might not be suitable. So for my solution in this region in Brazil, and I think colleagues who study other primates as well as all the people who study Moranquias would agree, 
that connectivity between remaining habitats is a really um, is is a is the map to success. It's going to be the way that we're going to help these animals figure out how they can move with changing habitats and changing climates and temperatures and planning these corridors in the right directions that will help them and making sure that they're going to have suitable habitats to move into, I think becomes a really important feature. And it's partly based on a lot of the science behind it, behind the work that's gone into it. Thanks very much. Um, so we have questions from a um, couple of graduate students on the chat board and uh, one Ian Tenman, uh, you're welcome to speak up if you'd like to, but uh, let me try to summarize your questions for Dr. Stryer. So one EV is asking um, how the um, increasingly more terrestrial behavior of the Murikis may have um, changed their susceptibility to disease and um, hunting. So that's one question. And the other question from Tianmen is um, basically, what's the secret for sustaining long-term studies like yours? <laughs> well, okay, those are both <laughs> great questions. Um, the, the question about the increase in ground use, I have no doubt that it has made them more vulnerable to, you know, certainly exposed to more pathogens. Um, we don't have any direct measures of what those pathogens are, but we have seen um, certainly coincidental with the increased use of the ground, higher mortality across all age classes, including males in prime ages, which are the male, that's the age class that spends the most time on the ground. And we've seen more mortality across all age classes. So I definitely think that there's a relationship there and I do think it could be due to predators. Um, my team, my field team students just um, two years ago, last, about a year ago now, it was a year, a year and a half ago, they, um, they, were, they saw an ocelot take an adult female who had come down to the ground to drink. No photos, but it happened in front of, right, in, right you know, before their eyes. So we know that the animals are, and we find, we find Muriki um, body parts in scat samples from some of the some of the cats. I worry a lot about the dogs in the the farm, the rural dogs that are moved into the area, and are, some of them are people's pets, and some of them are just strays that um, hunt in the forest because, of course, the Murikis on the ground are potential prey to them as well. So definitely has increased um, some of that. The other question, how you keep a long-term study going? I mean, I've had years where um, I used to economize every cent. You know, I would sleep on my students' floors when I would go to the field so that I would save money on hotel rooms. So I didn't have to, um, you know, because sometimes a couple of days in a hotel in a big city would be like what it would cost to keep someone in the field for a month. And the idea that, um, you know, when, when I have a little more money, I, I do, as I get older, I live maybe travel a little more comfortably when I can, but certainly for many, many years, I was, um, I was, was not too proud to be really stingy or, you know, taking the overnight bus because then you didn't have to sleep anywhere. You could sleep on the bus and, you know, that saved a lot of money um, for hotels and taxis and room service and, you know, or, you know, meals, whatever you could see popcorn on the bus. <laughs> but I would have to say that um, you have to just be willing to pretty much do anything you can to keep things going. I would say I've, always followed all the rules never broken one of the you know brazil is a really hard country for foreigners to work in there's a lot of um, regulations about what kinds of what you need to do to get research permits and i'm i'm follow all the rules and um i mentioned this earlier i've worked with a lot of people there and you know having having um feeling like 
there are people like when we were trying to find the monkeys during the yellow fever, right after the yellow fever, the peak in the yellow fever, um, me and two of my colleagues went back to the forest it was one of my usual trips. And we got there and, you know, we couldn't find any primates and I was really freaking out. And I just contacted some of the previous recent students who were now back in the cities. And they said, you know, can you guys come out? Are you doing anything? Could you take, could you spend a month or two and help us try to find all the rest of the population? And in two months we found everyone that was still alive. It was really amazing. You know, people were calling, getting in touch with me and volunteering to come out at their own expense if we needed their help. And I guess, you know, that, that we didn't need to, if use people at their own expense, but if we had to, we could have, and that makes a huge, huge difference. So I would say collaborate and follow the rules and be prepared to do anything it takes to raise the funds. And I, you know, people all have often said, wow, you know, you've had continuous funding. That's amazing. But I always say that for every grant that I get, you know, there's a whole bunch that no one hears about that I don't get. Um, and that's another thing, you know, and never give up, never give up. Well, um, that's wonderful advice. Um, I think this is probably a good place to... Uh, Susuma, sorry yes. to interrupt. Oh. Tiamun mm -hmm. just showed himself there. I think he wanted to say Oh, something. did he? I'm sorry. I uh, missed him. Hi. Are you there, Tiamun? Add to him in. Do you want to say something? I think he's speaking. We can't hear you, Tiamun. Oh, how about now? Oh, good. Yes. Yep. Oh, I, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, too. Um, thanks. Thanks for all your help with this. With the poster. Yeah, he's, he's really good with posters and everything. Mm -hmm. his, his work, you should talk with him sometime about his, his ecological work with Japanese macaques. I think you find it very it interesting. That'd be great. Yeah, so, all right. Um, I think this is probably a good place to um, stop the live streaming on the YouTube side. Um, um, but I, I, everyone's welcome to stick around for a few more minutes uh, if you would like to chat with uh, Dr. Straya, and uh, I wanted to um, thank you again for your wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. It was excellent. Well, thank you for thank you for the 